agreed to, and I call the honourable member for Perth. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I rise to oppose this bill. Uh, and uh, the member for Grandler has uh, very cogently pointed out uh, the difficulties with this bill and the unfairness to do with this bill in terms of, uh, of, labour, of labour market provisions and has also touched upon the issues of na national security uh, that have arisen time and time again um, when we look at um, the demise of the uh, of, uh, a, a nation's uh, own ability uh, to sustain a, uh, a shipping fleet. And, um, on that later point, we note um, that American analysis of the Jones Act, which the member for Grandler referred to um, comprehensively, uh, found very significantly uh, the importance of having a, a domestic uh, a fleet that could be diverted um, in times of, uh, of national crisis to assist the tasks and uh, reference the, uh, uh, the role of that um, shipping industry in uh, indeed fuelling um, the efforts in the various Gulf Wars. But I want to uh, talk today perhaps about, an, uh, about another issue that hasn't been touched on uh, and one that I have had uh, personal experience um, of, and that is the ability uh, for us here in Australia to sustain a skilled uh, workforce within our ports. Now, I've had uh, for uh, almost eight years. I had responsibility uh, for uh, running uh, of WA's eight uh, eight uh, ports, uh, and these ports, um, particularly if you look at the uh, Pilbara ports, uh, were indeed um, some of the largest uh, ports in the in the world in terms of uh, in terms of uh, tonnage shipped through them. And what has become evident um, from my experience then, uh, and indeed all the reports that were made to me at the time, and I see from um, my research, uh, continues to be to be the case uh, that there are critical skills in the operation of ports that require um, people with uh, profound and extensive blue water experience. And these, of, these skills, of course, include these um, um, key uh, tasks, include harbour masters, they include uh, port marine pilots, they include tug operators, um, and they include marine engineers. Now, all of these are absolutely critical skill sets uh, for the conduct of sophisticated, uh, sophisticated port operations. And, and I note the... Uh, uh, the previous speaker was getting worked up uh, because you know some of these reports had been um, prepared by entities that he thought were um, the Australia Institute in particular he seemed to have some difficulty with. But you know I'm looking at a report prepared um, uh, by uh, Victor Gikara for RMIT University um, for the Transport and Logistic Industry Skills Council and, in, and uh, re reports that are also being backed up um, by a variety of government agencies and indeed port authorities around the, com uh, around the country, pointing out just how critical it is uh, for us to have those skills and how difficult it is increasingly uh, to find uh, these skills within Australia. And it is not, uh, it is, it goes directly uh, to the question of the absence and decline of a domiciled, sh um, uh, domiciled ship owners, because it says this: the absence of domiciled ship owners engaging in cadet training has led to a depletion of the existing pool of mariners uh, due to natural wastage as well as sectorial migration. So it is basically without any workforce replenishment at the bottom, uh, we are simply not getting the people that are coming through as recruits and then becoming junior officers and working their way up. So if we continue to have this erosion of uh, a domiciled Australian shipping industry, we are going to continue to lose those very critical skill sets that we need to have port operation. And the previous speaker 
I went on at length about him wanting to protect um, the, uh, the timber industry, wanting to protect the dairy industry, wanting to ensure uh, that they had the capacity to export their, pro their product. Now, I agree absolutely. But an absolutely critical part of that supply chain is, and that trade facilitation is the efficient operation of ports. And ports just simply uh, cannot operate without deep skill sets in all of those areas. And, and I have seen ports um, of, I guess, a variety of levels of sophistication in their, in their operation and understand uh, the, how critical it is in, uh, to have uh, deep skill sets and to have people with um, deep and profound logistical abilities and how that can uh, turn a port around. Uh, I note, um, just if, if I could talk about um, the Port Headland facility, which is now part of the combined Pilbara reports. Um, there was a time when um, a BHP would uh, question uh, whether or not we could get um, much more than 190,000 tonnes out, uh, out of that port. Uh, last year, that, ton, that port uh, got 264,000 uh, tonnes um, of iron ore out of that, uh, sort of on a, single, on a single day. I mean, it is just extraordinary that, the large, that we would get a shipment of, uh, of that size. Now, if I could talk about the, that on a single tide, so Port Hedland is a, a heavily uh, tidal port, and these ships are very large, and it is a challenge how, how many ships you can actually bring out on a single tide. And uh, the Port Hedland Port Authority, the Port Hedland um, facility of the Pilbara Ports, was uh, earlier this year able to ship out 1.5 million tonnes on eight Cape class bulk carriers within a single tidal wi window of 4.75 hours. Now you don't do that. You don't do that without profound logistical capacity, without profound skill levels in your uh, in your pilotage and in uh, the port traffic the port traffic operations. And these are all people. These are all skill sets that are acquired after uh, very detailed and lengthy experience <coughs> as blue water mariners. So. Uh, I, I say to members, um, look at where this, this whole issue of an Australian uh, shipping industry fits within um, our ability to run ports that are efficient, ports that are able to cut costs, ports that are able to move, use the infrastructure in the most um, pos um, efficient way possible. So it's not just a question of, uh, of looking at the industry itself. We need to look at the superstructure that is very much dependent on there being skill formation um, going on within the, uh, within the country. So um, I'm um, uh, very concerned that, in a, you know, as, as the member for Granler says, in a, in a nation where we are 85 per cent of what we produce we export. Uh, that we have, we are uh, responsible only uh, for exporting about two percent. Uh, Australian companies are responsible for only uh, exporting around two percent of the product uh, that is produced on our shores. And as I said, that is just um, insufficient to either generate um, the jobs that we need to keep Australians. Uh, Get going, and certainly it's insufficient to generate the jobs that we need uh, to have efficient, uh, efficient port operations. So, um, we, uh, uh, w our current account deficit, obviously, uh, would be so much better if we were able to, if we were able to attract a much larger. Um, portion of shipping to come to Australia, and I think this legislation, um, uh, in addition to all the unfairnesses that um, that have been set out by the previous speakers, is also, uh, I think, a deeply irresponsible piece of legislation. It is certainly shows 
that Australia um, is one of the few developed nations uh, that has a large export industry that doesn't work very, very hard to ensure um, through legislative and fiscal means uh, that it sustains um, an, uh, an efficient uh, shipping, uh, shipping uh, locally based, locally domiciled shipping industry. They recognise uh, the value of creating those jobs in themselves, of allowing uh, Australians to have access to that work. Um, but equally importantly, they recognise the need uh, to have, as an exporting nation, to have deep maritime skills in order to be able to operate uh, efficient uh, port operations. I mean, if we are to be uh, to continue to be able to provide uh, jobs, uh, meaningful, good jobs for Australians, we need to make sure that we have uh, an Australian. Uh, based shipping industry. So um, uh, I will be um, supporting my colleagues on this side of the House and, um, and uh, re refusing to support this bill. I'm very mindful of the number of uh, maritime workers that I've met um, in recent, uh, recent times, a number of seafarers, highly skilled seafarers, who are uh, in Western Australia who are out of, uh, out of work. Uh, guys that have had exemplary uh, work records uh, that have, um, for the last 20 years, been employed in the industry now, um, with uh, uh, the particularly the uh, legislative requirement, the legislative diminution that has been brought in in terms of the uh, pipeline vessels um, offshore. Uh, the uh, the number of that uh, that work in the Australian resource sector in in pipeline and uh, servicing of rigs uh, that has been allowed to go offshore through the uh, uh, through the administrative dumbing down and non enforcement um, of the uh, of the rules in relation to um, our offshore um, our offshore resource facilities has seen. Um, many hundreds of uh, West Australian seafarers uh, lose, their, lose their jobs, and this legislation that we're seeing here today uh, will increase that um, will increase that trend. So, uh, I will not be supporting this legislation, and I really urge the government to uh, to rethink this. And I certainly hope that our our, our friends on the cross benches uh, in the Senate can see the folly of us losing yet another uh, key skill set um, and hence and uh, consequently undermine our capacity uh, to run um, our ports uh, around this country, those ports which are so absolutely critical uh, for trade facilitation. Thank you.